with that, I'll call up my brother so he can have a, a, a word before we, we step down. Um, author, historian, lecturer. I'm not trying to heap up praises, but I'm just giving you his, his resume. The things that he's doing, that he's doing on his own, um, that he's making some strides in his nation and having some influence and bringing a lot of people to the table to discuss a lot of poignant and focused things in his nation. Um, my brother, Chief Abdiel Ben Lawi. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First and foremost, giving all honor and praise to the Holy One of Israel, the God of our ancient forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true and the living God, even the most high God. He is our creator, our maker, our owner, and our possessor, and to him belongs the life of all worlds. I want to give due respect to the leadership here at DCB. I want to give uh, due respect to the fathers, the mothers, our princes, our princesses, our chiefs, the people, the people, the people, because we ain't nothing without the people. And I also want to uh, acknowledge a brother uh, who came with us today, who accompanied me here today, my brother Jeremiah. Thank you for coming out. You came a long way. You made it. You're here. All right. Um, we're going to just touch really briefly, guys, on... Um, some of the sentiment of Leviticus uh, 19. So if we could just open up to Leviticus 19, just verses one through three, and then we're, we're done. You know, today's Torah portion is a very powerful Torah portion because it's a reminder of that which is needed to traverse and journey through such rocky terrain in this physical and spiritual realm that we are moving through, right? All of the death, all of the calamity that is constantly around us is not if you are following true to what is recorded by your ancestors. The book says that thousands may fall to your left, mm -hmm. thousands may fall to your right, but it will not come where? Mm -hmm. Not unto you. But we say this as rote. Right? For many of us, we've been hearing this since we were children. A lot of y'all were born in this way of life. Those of us that came in as young teenagers, we've been hearing it for years too. The problem is, we're doing more listening than we're doing more acting upon. And that's the most important thing about this way of life. And that's the most important thing about the accumulation of information and wisdom and understanding. What is your wisdom worth? What is your understanding worth if you don't possess the equal ability to act upon them? Right? right? Often we uh, expose our loved ones, our children, to people who are so, what, they're, they're, they're intellectually astute. They could, they could quote from the dictionary and, you know, they could go from A to Z, from Olive to Tav. They're just amazing with their words and I promise you that's the only thing they're amazing with. And while we're mesmerized, you got to imagine God sees the heart. So we're up here and we're clapping and we're cheering, but God sees the heart. God knows that some of the very people who deliver some of the most impactful messages to us don't live nor walk it. So could you imagine how he takes in all of this? If I could mention this one word, this word knowledge, before we start reading. I was told years ago that the word knowledge meant... Uh, or to be knowledgeable means that a person has acquired wisdom and understanding. And um, I learned over the years that that's not necessarily true. Uh, the word knowledge is a compound word. The first part, know, represents acquiring information. Ledge is an old German word which means to act upon. So knowledge literally means to act upon what you know. 
can you imagine with that understanding how many people we automatically remove ourselves from in thought and deed when we understand that? You leave your children and loved ones with people who are amazing in speech because they're knowledgeable, but do they live it? Do they practice what they preach? What they used to say in the 90s, Chief? Are you the message that you bring and are you the song that you sing? With that, let's open up uh, Leviticus 19 really quick. And Yehoah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, Yehoah your God, am holy. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and ye shall keep my sharp toe. I am Yehoah your God. Hallelujah. The Creator literally just left us with the ingredients of life. Everything after and before is commentary. Dare I say, ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord thy God, am holy. One of the most basic and fundamental questions that every spiritual seeker, journeyman, and journeywoman should have on their mind is, what is the goal of creation? I ask this question often in my classes. And I hear some wonderful answers, but I really hear the answer. Most people say, well, the goal of creation is to live a meaningful life, have a family, build something, be involved in the curating and building of something, labor in something that you can pass down, right? Which requires now what? Family, tradition, that's all powerful. But guess what? That still ain't it. Because the point is, why are we all here? If we as religious people, and I know they looking at the screen right now, because what he mean when he say religious people, right? We don't like the word religion, right? I say religious people because as much as we don't like the word because of the connotation, most of us have a little bit of religion in us. The most spiritually refined among us have a little bit of religion within us. So I say as a quasi-religious people, one of the most fundamental things to know is what is the goal of creation, the G-O-A-L. A person who reads that Bible, they're going to say, fear God and keep his commandments. And guess what? You're close. What you mean now? You ain't that smart. Nope, I'm not. But I want you to hear me out. The book tells us Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole man. Right? The commentary says the whole duty of man, but the, the language says that's the whole man. But one thing I want to tell you is that when the creator created everything, right? Genesis chapter 1. With everything that's created, he says it was tov. And this was tov. And this creation was tov. And when this was complete, it was tov operative term, the completion of things made it tov in his eyes. Things come into completion. Look at your life. How complete are you? Look at the people that you surround yourself with. How complete are they in their thinking and in their faith and in their walk and in their actions? To the best of our ability, we can psychoanalyze the passages of the Torah and say that the creator created man with the intent of bestowing upon him the highest possible good, conceivable. Hence the psalmist says, I have no good but you. Because the highest possible conceivable good is a connection with the Almighty. So then the goal of creation is that the crown of creation, the one created last, man, become one with the Almighty. The commandments play a role in helping us to bridge that gap. They're a means and a method to the goal of the creation, but it's not the goal itself. You're not here to simply keep commandments. The commandments represent the method employed to get close to God. Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord thy God am holy. So how is holiness achieved? Spiritual emulation. Emulate the creator's walk. Listen to what he says to Abram before he even comes Abraham. 
he says, walk with me and be thou tamim, perfect, right? But this is why we love the language, because it plays out a little differently in the language, right? Where the Hebrew teaches that. When you read that passage, Be'ivrit, in the Hebrew, it says, Hit Halek, Yehovah. That word is in what's called the Hit Pa'el verb stem, right? And the Hit Pa'el verb stem, one of the seven major Hebrew verb stems, you're dealing with a stem that essentially is teaching you that the action, right, performed by the subject is causing something to happen to themselves. So when the book says, or when the creator says, he talek Yehovah, would you be surprised if I tell you he told Abraham, walk with yourself and be perfect? Because that's what the Hebrew says. Halak means to walk. He talek means to cause yourself to walk or to walk with yourself. Psychoanalyze that. Why would God say to Abraham, walk with yourself and become one with me or become perfect? if he's not also teaching you that he lives within you. That's the only way that you could walk with yourself and still meet him if he resides within you. Hence, when the creator gave the message to build the Mishkan, the sanctuary in the wilderness, he said, they shall build a temple and I shall dwell betokem within them, inside them, not inside it, inside them. Because the focal point of the temple is what? Kadosh Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies. What's the holiest thing in the temple? In the Holy of Holies? The Ark. What's the holiest item in the Ark? The Torah. So the Torah, right, which is what the temple is really symbolic of, right? The Torah itself is that which gives us the ability to have spiritual dexterity with the Creator to where our walk with him is so perfect that it's not like when me and my brother walk. When me and my brother step out and walk because we are Israelites, our walk is similar, baby. You might bop a little better than me, but we walk in together, right? You might be a little bit in the front, I might be a little bit in the back, but essentially we are together. That's not the walk God is talking about, though. You ever see how the Chinese military march? 40,000 men one foot goes up, 39,000 feet go up. One arm goes up, 39,000 arms go up. We're talking about a perfect cadence. That's the walk that the Creator is saying. And until we're able to meet that, we're not there yet. But don't beat yourself up. Don't say, I can't do it because I did this. I can't do it because I was once here because we have a record in the Tanakh of men and women who were once somewhere that God did not desire and God took them up out of, as our chief of chiefs would say, may his memory be blessed from the muck and the maya and made something out of them. If you are inspired by any of the people you ever see stand at podiums like this and you say to yourself, I wanna be just like them but I can't because I got this sin in my closet that I know God ain't going to do that for me. Let me be the first to tell you. There's not a person that stands here that would want to reveal to you what their closet look like. Right. Oh, we're going to say that loud for the people in the cheap seats? Right. Yeah, There's not a person that stands here mm -hmm. who would willfully show you what's inside their closet. Mm -hmm. So if you are inspired by any one of us that you see, just know that just how the Most High works with us in our imperfection, he can work with you in your imperfection. Because there's no man I heard that does good and sinneth not. And the beautiful thing about being righteous is righteous represents pursuing the creator. You ever watch cops? They chasing the subject, bad boys, bad boys, right? They chasing the perp. I'm in pursuit, I'm in pursuit. What does that mean? For those who might be in uh, the, the police uh, profession or anybody that works in law enforcement, you know that you can call in that you're in pursuit of a suspect, but that doesn't equal apprehension. So I want you to listen. 
the word for righteous in Hebrew is Zedek, right? Mm -hmm. The first part, Zed, is a hunter. What is a hunter by profession? Pursuer. Pursuer. What are we supposed to pursue? The kof. The Hebrew letter kof denotes emulation. Hence, it is the initial letter in the Hebrew word chadosh, holiness, which is teaching you how you attain to holiness. You are to pursue a relationship with the creator to the extent that no matter if you fall, you get back up. The first Bible I ever had in the Israelite way of life was in the year 1994. Damn, that was a long time ago. I'm 43 years old today. Thank God. And when I came into this way of life in the year 1994, we're not supposed to be saying this on Shabbat, but I got to speak my truth. I took my grandmother's Bible because it was the nicest Bible around. She had a Gideon's Bible. It was brown and it had gold trimming and it had my name on it in my mind, I thought. And I took her Bible, yes I did, and I read it. And on the opening page, you know those quotables you find in like the Bibles, not the Tanakh, but the Bibles. And the quotable said, had I not sat in the dark, I would not have been able to see the light. Had I not fallen, I would not have known what it means to rise. Don't you think for a single second that God can't work with you based on what you have been through or who you are now so long as you change and become what God has called you to be? You can be that which he calls. There's not a single person in here that should ever think, I can't be that. Because I want us to all analyze this, and I'm going to close with this. I see sun is down. That truth hit different, don't it? Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to say this to you. I want everybody to think about this. Samuel was called to anoint King David. Mm -hmm. And about eight sons of Jesse passed before him. Is my memory correct? About eight? Right. Sure. Seven, and then the dirty one came mm -hmm. that wind up being Dawid. All right. I want everybody to think about this. As the first one passes before Samuel, Samuel says, this got to be the one. God whispered in his ear, no, it's not. And let me tell you something. As God is saying, no, he's not, guess what God knows? That son won't go on to murder, nor will he go on to commit adultery. Second son passes by. Surely he's it. Look at him. Look at his shape. Look how his hair dropped. Mm -hmm. huh? He red boned it, did it. <laughs> right? That's not the one. And guess what God knows? He won't commit murder ever because we have no record of David's brothers doing that. He won't commit adultery ever. We have no record of his brothers doing that as each of the seven sons of Jesse pass and God says no, he knows because he's the omniscient one, the past, present, and future are one reality. He knows none of them will commit murder or adultery. And here comes David, the little squaggly one, the one that smelled like the field. The one who God know, you got to watch this one. He loved God, but he loved women too. And guess what? what? Should be impactful for everybody that can hear my voice. When God chose him, he knew what David would do negatively. And he still chose to work with him. So don't you ever think that as a broken vessel, the Almighty cannot work with you and make you whole again. Because I promise you, the Creator has this, this, this way about him if I could say, dare I say, that it is almost as if he gets his glory, not when he goes and finds the perfect person. Because that's, that's easy, right? I take this person that's perfect and do great things with them. You could expect that, right? But what happens when I reach for that person who, while they might not be perfect, perfect, the reality is, and my bottom lip is shaving because this is hitting home, 
The reality is their environment helped to shape the negativity within them. I'm talking to you right now. The reality is they were not perfect because of some of the people and elders that they had around them. Am I talking to your soul now? The reality is they may have been other factors that may have led to why they were not perfect. God sees through that. There are people in the world who are perfect because they never had no challenge. How are you perfect when you live on an island full of righteous people? Free will is a fundamental aspect of creation. Without it, how do we know you're righteous? There's no wicked around. Can't call you righteous. So in order for there to be true free will, the possibility of something other than good must exist. Evil. Right? And I'm not going to prolong that, but I do want to say this. If you just psychoanalyze for a moment the choosing of David and how God still worked with him, God called that man the apple of his eye, knowing what that man was going to do with another woman who was the apple of her man's eyes and somebody's son who was the apple of their parents' eyes, and God still worked with them. My message to you is, the Torah portion today is to emulate the creator. Chase after him. Righteousness represents pursuing the creator. If you run after something long enough, you're gonna fall. And I almost said it the way I really wanna say it. But trust me, when you chase after God, it is inevitable that you will fall because anything you run after, you're going to fall. Don't get up. Don't sit on the floor and say to yourself, I can't get up. Get up. Wipe the dust off your cardiac, your behind, and know for a surety that you are the one that God has called and chosen. Hallelujah, Yisrael. Thank you, the creator of heaven and earth, Yehoah Zavahot. Thank you, the most high God, from my brother, Chief Naftali Ben Don. And also thank you, the most high God, for the words that my brother, um, Chief Abdi El But um, in these circles, we know him as um, Chief Abdel Ben Levy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's his stage name, Zion Lex. 